So my name is Martha Senator. The show is Listen and Be Heard, an hour for writers and readers. And my guests today are Glennis Redmond and Anna Castro Spratt, both uh, poet laureates of Greenville in South Carolina, where this show originates from. And not only are you two poet laureates, one um, the senior and one the junior, um, but you're also the first poet laureates of Greenville, South Carolina. So welcome to Listen and Be Heard. I'm very happy to have you here. We had you here previously, Glennis, um, my co-host Tony Robles interviewed you about your book, The Listening Skin. So right. it's nice to have you back to talk uh, about some other things. Thank you. Thanks for having us. I was wondering, how did it come about? Come about, And how did you find out that there was going to be, or were you involved maybe even in Greenville having a poet laureate? It seems to be something that's happening more and more around the country. How did it happen here in Greenville, South Carolina? Well, I felt like that I had been uh, unofficially a poet laureate in South Carolina as that the position is to be a poet, but also have an outreach, a very active outreach. And it was about 12 years ago, I had talked to certain people about having a poet laureate of South Carolina because Charleston had one, Columbia had one, Rock Hill had a poet laureate, and of course Greenville um, should have had one. And there were several people in the community who were interested. I think Furman, the Metropolitan Arts Council, the city, um, the Peace Center where I was poet in residence. So it took about 12 years for it to come to fruition. And then when they decided to do it, then they held uh, submissions. And so people had to apply, myself, I had to apply. And um, at the end I was chosen and so glad to be on this two year term. One of my things that I was very, very passionate about was having a youth poet laureate. So um, we have our fine youth poet laureate, Anna, and I'm so glad. That. Because sharing the start together. Sorry, I'm interrupting you just as I was instructing us not to. Um, tell me about, please, though, the the po why a youth poet laureate. I think that's not happening quite as much as just poet laureates in general. And why was that important to you? Well, I had worked with a team of youth as a the poet and resident of the Peace Center. And also when I lived in Asheville, I was very interested in taking poetry to the youth because I'm a teaching artist and I go into the schools. But across the country, there the, the United States does have a Youth Poet Laureate and many cities had started it. And I thought Greenville should have that as well because when young people speak, I think their voice is, um, I, I won't say more passionate, but it's a different passion. It, they're on fire and they can speak to their peers in a way that I think older folks cannot and they can also talk to the adults and hold their feet to the fire so I believe in young people and I'm just really proud that we picked a stellar poet laureate for our first our, our inaugural youth poet laureate Anna. Thank you. Anna Castro Spratt and so yeah. Anna how did you hear about this and how was it for you to go through the process? Well, a couple of months before the application for Greenville's Youth Poet Laureate, I'd been involved in a program called Youth in Government in South Carolina. Um, and it's kind of a mock legislature system. We mock the government, the judicial system as well. And on the very first night for the first year, they wanted to have um, a YMCA Youth Poet Laureate. And when I found out about this, I've already been on leadership in the program. I'd known the people very well. And I talked to them and I said, I really, I want to make this happen because it was kind of just thrown out just as an idea um, and ended up being able to happen. And I read my first poem as a youthful laureate at that conference. When I got back to school, I was great friends with my librarians at my old school, Riverside. And I told them and I was so excited about it. And they hadn't known that I was writing poetry so passionately. And a couple of weeks later, I was in the library again. And my librarian came back up to me and she said, hey, Anna, um, you know, Greenville is looking for one, too. There's an open application now. And 
for me, I mean, it was kind of both a testament to how amazing so many educators can be, but also I felt like it was a little bit of a fate that I'd be able to apply. Um, and when I applied, I it was a process. There was a written portion. I had to send in videos, you know, um, and I just, I'm really grateful that I was able to get this position. That's wonderful. So the position, what is the position of Poet Laureate? How do you figure that out? And how do you see the two of you working together over these two years? What are you hoping to do? Well, we, 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 there's not a whole lot you have to figure out. You have to be passionate about poetry. Every poet laureate's um, mandate is different from city to city or state to state. And they have that we both have to do five um, poetry engagements in the communities. Um, most likely with the community and rec centers. And then we are available on call through this inquiry system. You can go to the Greenville cities, uh, page, web page, and request either one of us to go uh, to uh, speak anywhere in the city or in the county, actually. Uh, to this date, I have done 32 engagements, even though only five are required. So it's something that I um, feel passionate about because our job is basically to spread the love of poetry and to demystify it for those who feel like they don't like poetry. I just feel like people haven't found the right poet when they say they don't like poetry. So we have done some joint things together. Our first thing that we did together was the Jazz Festival last June. So we, we were there and I was also there when um, she was inducted at the courthouse, when Anna was con um, inducted at the courthouse. And have you done anything other than that yet as as the city poet laureate, Anna, on your own? Um, I've also had a couple of engagements. I have one upcoming with the youth um, committee for the city council um, this, I think, May um, as the last meeting. Um, I think Glennis might have the opportunity to do as well. I'm not sure if you were inquired about it. Um, and then, of course, there's just a bunch more events that I'm looking forward to doing as well. I've got a couple of things at school with readings that aren't necessarily with the Youth Poet Laureate program, but um, I'm sure there's a lot coming up and I'm really excited for all those too. In the past, we just did a bus poetry project where we interviewed bus riders. That's right. Um, yeah, and we wrote poems about them and what we learned about their lives. It was really amazing being able to read that and hear what other people were writing and see the appreciation that we got from so many people for writing about them. Because I think that's the people so much. Are interested in that poetry from the whole bus thing, how can they, mm -hmm. how can they access that? You can go to the city page and um, find the link. There's a QR code. And if you're a bus writer in the city, they're on the bus shelter. So you can just put your phone up there. You can see the poet doing the poem. You can see the poem in print. So, and I'm so glad you reminded that we uh, did phone, that. We can hold it up to the QR code and then see that on your phone. Is you can see it on your phone. You can hear the poem. You can see the poem. And okay. it, it just, and I don't know if you knew this, but Nicole uh, McCadden, who was the person through the city who works for um, Greenlink, um, that project, the Bus Poetry Project, just won a national award. And oh, amazing. Well, congratulations, yeah. then. <laughs> you heard it first on Listen to Me. <laughs> yeah. <That's laughs> well, uh, do you, on that note, then, do you feel like you also are representing um, Greenville City in some way. When you like, have you gone beyond the city? And is there like is some way in which you represent Greenville? As I don't know, maybe there's a big poet laureates national gathering or something that I that I don't know about. Um, well, for me, uh, well, for me, um, even before I was poet laureate, I traveled nationally and internationally. I've been doing this work for 30 years. And so, of course, uh, I continue that work. Right now, I'm committed to the city and the county and also the state. So I try to do as much as I possibly you, can. You do hail from here, Glennis. 
I yes, I do. I was born in Sumter, South Carolina, um, on the uh, Shaw Air Force Base. I'm an Air Force brat, so I lived all over the world and moved. My parents moved back here when I was in middle school. And so this is my anywhere I could call home. This is where I can call home. So I'm a native of everywhere and of South Carolina. I am not a native of South Carolina, but I do call Greenville home these days. Um, for quite a while now, since 2009, and I remember several years ago, I did not introduce myself at the time, but I went to hear you at the Greenville County Museum, and you were talking about Dave the Potter. So, oh, correct. Um, and, you know, reading some beautiful poetry, not to mention those illustrations. Every time um, Jonathan posts one on Facebook, I would just want to share it with everybody because each one is so gorgeous. Um, but I would like to get you to talk for a moment about Dave the Potter because he was a poet. And yes. also, I don't know if he had any connection directly with Greenville, but people can see his work at the Greenville County Museum. Right. Well, he's, I write a lot about um, unearthed stories in the African American community and our lineage. And David Drake was an enslaved Potter poet, which, you know, those two words seldom go together. Someone who is enslaved would definitely do work and might be an artisan, but ne not necessarily uh, be able to read and write, which he did. And he learned to read and write. They think he learned because his, um, owner had a printing press and he had to clean the printing press. So he learned, he became literate and then not took that long leap from literacy to being um, a poet. And he inscribed his pots, normally with couplets, but not always uh, uh, couplets that remained on his pots. And when I became aware of this, maybe 13 years ago, I became very interested in even more interested when I found out that my mentor, spiritual and um, artistic mentor, Jonathan Green, had already painted his likenesses in uh, his likeness in the 90s. And so it was a full circle moment for me to create that book with some other wonderful collaborators, uh, Gabriel Foreman, who is the editor and a MacArthur genius, and then also Dr. Lynette Overby, who's at University of Delaware. So we danced Dave to life. Uh, we wrote about Dave. There was painting of Dave's, interviewing um, Jonathan Green. So it's one of those wonderful projects that I think everybody coming together, it amplified um, Dave, Dave's work, even though he doesn't, I don't think he really needed us. I think we needed him more than anything because mm -hmm. at a time where I feel like our history is, you know, people are trying to erase our history. We need to be vigilant about telling these stories that not just African-Americans need to hear, but everybody needs to hear. Did he have a connection to Greenville or was it he more coastal? No, it was not coastal or uh, Greenville. I will say it's Edgeville, which is about 45, 50 minutes south of Piedmont going on, you know, Highway 25 to Edgeville, little, little town, Edgeville. He may have had Columbia co um, connections, they think. Our connection is that our uh, Greenville County Museum of Art is the largest holder of David Drake Potts in the country. And so- there's a reason to come to Greenville. That's because, a very good reason. Yeah, you're gonna. Yeah, so I think you know Greenville is um, setting set a, a really powerful tone by having his his work there. And if anyone hasn't seen his work, I really really That's encourage cool. them to go because the pots are to me they are very beautiful. Some will call them rugged. Um, I just think they're beautiful manifestations of a man who created. Uh, through through his livelihood created these wonderful jugs and pots and you know urns and turns so and while many museums for whatever reason are expensive to go to this one is free yes so that's not a reason not to go um so Glennis you are from right around here but Anna you came to us from Brazil 
Yes. Right. Um, I was born yes. in Illinois, where my dad's side of the family is, a really tiny little city called Dixon. Oh. Um, and I lived there right up until almost my fifth birthday. So it was four. And we moved to Brazil right after that. I have a lot of family there. My mom's entire side is from Brazil. So we lived near Sao Paulo in a, in a little city there. And I have family from all over, from an area called Minas Gerais, which is closer to Rio de Janeiro than Sao Paulo is. And we still go back almost every year. But when I was, I think, seven or eight, we moved here to Greenville. We were just looking for new opportunities, new place to live. And this is where we ended up. And I love it. It's great. Well, that's wonderful. And you um, have attended both the Fine Arts Center and the Governor's School here in Greenville. Yeah. So um, I think you've really embraced the, the artistic cultural community that you're in. Um, I had a couple more questions, but I, I what I did not warn either of you was that I was going to ask you to read a poem each. So maybe um, I hope that you're prepared to do that um, this evening. And I just wanted to ask, uh, I, I've been asking um, most of our guests about um, banned books, the, the phenomenon of banned books in this country. And I wanted to ask about the library here, your relationship with the library, how you feel about banned books. I think it's my understanding that the library is not putting out displays in order to avoid some controversy over banned books. And I wonder if our poets laureates could maybe speak on the subject for a moment. Well, first of all, let me say my relationship to the library in Greenville is very um, fortuitous in the fact that I was an avid library goer in middle school and I lived in the rural part of uh, the county. And one of the ways I had access was the bookmobile that came to our neighborhood. And I was one of those kids who ran after the bookmobile like some kids run after the ice cream truck. Mm -hmm. And so it really was important to me for to, to, to read and to expand my mind and my horizon. I was always on a path, you know. So I I want to I want to say that, and I've always supported the library. Now on banned books, I you know here's what I feel about banned books is that you should read what you want to read. <laughs> and um, matter of fact, I think when we ban books, we actually highlight attention to those books so they will be read. So I think we should be mindful of what I don't I don't think it's uh, another citizen's right to to ban somebody else from what they um, deem important in their life. And so I did not know about them not putting out um, displays about the banned books, but I have been, I did go to the, the last um, board meeting. So I wanna get a little bit more involved, but I'm of course an outspoken advocate that everyone should be able to read whatever they want to read. Um, when I was young, I was not limited. My parents let me read everything. and um, I felt like that was helping me to become a poet. I needed that that the 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 authors were I felt like they were friends that I had never met and they were keepers of a map and they provided me a map to figure out what I needed to do in my life. Thank you. And Anna, do you do you have something I really agree with what Glennis is saying. I think, you know, if there is something that you want to read, you shouldn't be denied access to that, right? Um, I think that literacy and interest in literature is something that we want to promote and we want to get out there. And when you're telling someone that something that they may want isn't available to them, you're telling them that whatever they'll want in the future isn't something they should want, right? And even though, like some books may have undertones and lessons that some people may not want in their lives. It's their decision to, to make that choice. And if they do want that, that says what it needs to about them. And it's not necessarily at the book's fault. I think it's 
more the fault of any policymaker who's deciding that, you know, someone who's interested in literature should not be. Because that's, that's really what a book ban is. You're saying that whatever you're interested in, you don't have the right to be interested in that. And I think that that's way more problematic than what may be within those books themselves. Hmm. No, there's Agreed. A big Agreed. I haven't heard yet. Well, thank you both for that. Are, are we prepared to have a little poetry in here? <laughs> sure. I would love that. Thank you. Who would like to go first? Anna? Yeah, I can pull something up. Okay. Oh, I can. I, are you pulling something up? I'll go first. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Perfect. Okay. I'll read from Listening Skin and I'll, um, there is one David Drake poem, the enslaved potter poet in my book, The Listening Skin, and it's called Forefather. And before I read, I just want to, I want to uh, go back and talk about uh, the, the importance of allowing people to read what they need to read. Um, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings by Maya Angelou is one book that gets banned a lot. And it was a book when I was 15 that changed my life. And yes, there were hard topics, but some of the things that she encountered in her life that were difficult were things that had happened to me in my life. And it gave me a lifeline. So I think we really need to be careful when we are banning, um, we, are, we can be banning someone's lifeline. And I think we need to be careful not to do that. I do think parents have the right to, you know, what whatever they want to do in their household and what they say is appropriate for their their your their young people. But for the way I look at it, I think you expand your mind, you broaden your horizon, and um, you become, especially about history, you become we, you come, you become empathetic with others. And I think that is what we need in a, America, across the world. We need more empathy. And that's what a book has always done for me. I don't have to be Jewish to understand um, the Holocaust. I understand that apartheid and how it relates to me and the sadness and the compassion that I feel. You don't have to be African-American to understand the chattel slavery that went on here. And I'm, I'm naming some horrific things, but there are also beautiful things that happen in our culture that we can share and we can unite and we can come together um, by understanding each other's culture. And I think that's important and that is lacking, um, especially with people who are trying to erase history and say, this is not important, this is not necessary. So I um, want to make that note that we should celebrate each other by reading each other's work. That's why it's important to have different poet laureates from different viewpoints. So we both will only have two terms and then it will go on to someone else and we'll have different views and they'll have a different platform and um, we can tell our stories. The poem that I'm gonna read is called Forefather for David Drake. When the landscape does not bear black blo blooms, I reach my arm back for one who flares with instruction. Read what he wrote on edge fill pots. This a noble churn, fill it up and it'll never turn. From my childhood home, a mere 73 miles ragged stretch from Piedmont to Edgeville separates us. I make him out through 155 years through the muck and the fog of pale deceit. I let my fingers touch the clay brilliance, see him a solid figure a South Carolina son, a literary father with no daguerreotype. I conjure his visage in both verse and vessel through the whorls of his fingertips. I walk along the loops and ridges, sit between the lines of his etched couplets, press ear to the hum of hardened clay, hear him say, empty yourself. Pry these tight spaces open. Listen to the mountains and valleys I withstood.
Sorry, I muted myself for better sound. Thank you so much for that, Glennis. I do appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And Anna, what do you have something to offer us today? Yeah, so this is a poem I just recently wrote. So this is my first time reading it. Um, it's titled, When I Met My Doppelganger. She had long brown hair that I had never learned to love until I braided it from behind, watched the way it creased down her spine like it never had in the mirror. I took her to the jazz club down the street where we met our first boyfriend so I could experience the velvet tunes for the first time again. Observed how her fingers tapped at the hips of her skinny jeans that I hadn't worn since middle school. But now I loved the denim, how it followed our curves in a way my own dresses didn't. And for the first time, I thought I loved a woman. In the summer, we drove to the dull lakes to the cliffs I'd been too afraid to jump from, but told her I used to easily, so I could watch her from below, the way our body hit the water painlessly and sunk below the pond's skin. We watched a map turn blue and red in the fall. We turned to each other and talked politics, who we'd cast one ballot for, even though it was no discussion. Being one, we repeated and nodded until we were just one voice. And I realized that was all we loved, hearing the sounds of our own voices rattling inside each other's bones, spitting images back and forth. Hmm. You heard Beautiful. it first here. <laughs> Listen and be heard. I want to thank you so much, Anna Castro Spratt. Thank you. Dennis Redmond, the Teen Poet Laureate and the Poet Laureate, the inaugural Poet Laureates of Greenville, South Carolina. I want to thank you for, for being our poet laureates. And I hope to uh, hear, you know, let us know if you're reading some poetry around town. Well, I hope that you'll look out for us because we'll have um, some things coming up in March. Visual and verse will be at the um, Metropolitan Arts Council. And it will, I'm pairing uh, poets with artists Mm -hmm. And the artists will write, I mean, the artists will paint, the poets will write, and we'll have a, in March, look at the Metropolitan Arts Council's website, you'll find that. And in April, I'll be doing a workshop at the Peace Center. Um, and then May 10th, there will be a convening of poet laureates, and we'll be featuring our last, our former poet laureate of the United States, Joy Harjo, and mm -hmm. the other poet, yes, yes, I that's what we want to be there. Yes. Google the Peace Center, and you can also look at my website, glennisredman.com. But the other poet laureates I will be featuring that night are Jackie Shelton um, Green, Crystal Wilkinson, and Ed Madden and myself. And then also I will be doing a Kavi Khanum workshop, which is an African-American retreat. And that will be at the Upstate Circle of Friends. People can look at my website to find what's going on with that and look for um, Anna and I pairing together in this. Our last, my, she has another year, but it will be my last year. Um, what is um, your website, Glennis? It's just my name, GlennisRedman.com. And what about you, Anna? How can people find you in social media? If you want them social to. media, I have an Instagram handle, Anna C. Spratt. I usually post whenever I'm reading, wherever I'll be. Um, and of course, just reaching out for any inquiries. You can look at the Greenville City website and ask for us to read. And I'm looking forward to seeing what else comes up. Well, thank you very much. And maybe you'll both come and read when we inaugurate WLBH Radio in Greenville, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, let us know. We would love to come. <laughs> That's our job. So we would love to come. Anna's really busy. I'm busy as well. We're both really busy, but we, we're very passionate about the word. So we'll 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 make an effort to get there. It's a great thing to know. I didn't know actually that citizens could just request it. And yes. Any so that's yes, no, it is. Um uh, I will be at a um the upstate poets on Sunday at 2.30 and they requested that I come. If I'm available and I have time, I try to, you know, like I said, I, the dock is, gets really full, but I try to make an effort to to do that and um, look forward to um, joining you in the radio. So right. it'd be great. Thank you very much to both of you. Thank, Thank you. you.
Thank you, Martha.